too. <laughs> I want you to know the original title of my radio show was like, No, shut up! Just... No, shut up! <laughs> oh, see, I'm not that short. Hang on. I'm very particular. Former self-defense. One summer evening years ago, when I was a nice college-bound high school senior, my girlfriend and I were wandering around the sidewalks of a closed shopping center along with some other nice college-bound seniors. But there were also some bad kids there, the kids who were headed for lives of petty crime and repeated misdemeanor citations, before finally giving in and becoming policemen. <laughs> we were on foot. They were driving around in an old Chevy. Thus, you could tell us apart. The Chevy pulled up next to me and the driver rolled down his window. Hey, he yelled, you guys have any drugs? Like the Terminator, I possess an interior view screen that displays various potential replies to such challenges. I selected smartass mode and replied, If I had any drugs, would I be walking around out here? What did you say? There might have been an abort option flashing in my view screen, but I ignored it. I said, If I had any drugs, would I be... The doors of the car flew open and four large young men flew out of it. Apparently the ancient Talmudic technique of answering a question with a question was deeply offensive to them. <laughs> the driver came straight at me, his face contorted with anger, his mullet undulating. <laughs> he grabbed me by the collar of my sweatshirt and pushed me back against the plate glass window of a knick-knack store. What did you say? I began doing what I did best during those days of my wild youth. I apologized. I apologized for any offense, actual, imagined, intended, or otherwise. I described my remorse from various angles in the way you would describe a Frank Geary building to a blind man. <laughs> my girlfriend, who was now about 20 yards ahead of me down the sidewalk, called out irritated, Come on, Peter! as if I'd inconvenienced her by choosing to chat with a group of passers-by, while one of them massaged my Adam's apple with his knuckles. Be right there, I said, and continued to apologize. My hands were up by my ears, but to make sure this was seen as a gesture of surrender rather than aggression, I wiggled my fingers a bit. <laughs> there must be a kind of code among suburban ne'er do wells dictating that you can't beat up somebody who is so willing to abase himself, so the leader released his grip on my nascent wattle. I slid a bit down the glass. As they turned and walked back to their car, they seemed deflated. Then one of them stopped, turned again, and kicked the air right in front of my face. I would demonstrate this, but I would hurt myself. <laughs> a martial arts move of some kind, either a warning as to what I just avoided or an attempt at a dominant animal crotch display. <laughs> I caught up with my friends, and nobody said a word. In fact, I don't think anybody said anything to anyone about anything until we all broke up with one another and went to college. A decade later, I was studying Aikido, a Japanese martial art known for its flowing movements and its strong attraction for bookish dorks. <laughs> Suffice it to say that in every dojo I have ever been in, somebody has laughingly tried out the Vulcan nerve pinch on somebody else. <laughs> Aikido appeals to nonviolent types because in its classic form it is entirely defensive. All of its maneuvers are responses to attacks. If two Aikido masters were to fight, they would stand staring at each other in perfect readiness, waiting for somebody to do something until the night janitor came by and made them leave. <laughs> One afternoon in the dojo, I found myself thinking about that long ago evening at the shopping center, as I had about every 15 minutes since. I asked the instructor if there was a proper technique for defending yourself against an attacker who had you by the throat and was holding you up against a knick-knack shop. <laughs> Let's try it, he said. The class broke up into small groups, with some people unknowingly replicating me, the others taking on the role of my attackers. The instructor demonstrated a simple yet powerful defensive move. I tried it, and my attacker collapsed in pain. <laughs> or you could do this, said the instructor, and then I was happily hurling my training partners onto the mats, twisting their arms in such a way that somewhere back in New Jersey, grown men who had completely forgotten me and long ago sold that car felt a twinge in their shoulders. <laughs> What about, I asked, if someone tries to kick you in the face? Oh, that's easy, said the instructor. Grab and twist. An obliging partner offered to kick me in the face. <laughs> no, I said, do it sideways like a karate kick. He adjusted, I grabbed and twisted, and he fell to the mat with a gratifying oomph of ejected air. Do it again, I said. Again! <laughs> I felt at peace. I realized that now that all I had to do was track down my long-lost girlfriend, who I believe is living in Texas with her husband. Then I would wait for someone to drive by in a Camaro. 
I would know just what to say. <laughs> Many years ago, an older writer who had befriended me told me a story. Many years ago, an older writer befriended me and handed me an envelope, she said. Inside that envelope was a hundred dollar bill. She told me to use that hundred dollars in anything that I needed to help my writing, research materials, a trip, a couple of bottles of booze, whatever. The only condition was that someday I find another writer at the beginning of his or her career and pass it on, as she had done for me. And then my friend solemnly gave me an envelope containing a hundred dollar bill. It was one of the most meaningful gestures of faith that anyone has ever bestowed on me. Plus, it was the first time I had held a hundred dollar bill that I hadn't made myself with construction paper and crayon. <laughs> I dropped my writer friend at the airport, misty-eyed and full of ideas for how I would use that money to start forging the uncreated conscience of my race in the smithy of my soul. A book on writing? Paper? Just outside the airport, as I turned onto the freeway, I saw an attractive young woman waving her arms frantically. I pulled over. My car's stuck in the freeway, she cried, and I called the tow truck, but I don't have enough money to pay them. I'm just $20 short, and the cops told me that if my car's not gone in half an hour, they'll impound it. Please, can you help me? And then I found myself saying a remarkable thing, something that I have never expected to say in the whole course of my life, and certainly not in these particular circumstances. I said, all I have is a $100 bill. She looked at me expectantly. I'll have to get change, I said. I can wait, she said. She cheerfully hopped into the passenger seat when I walked down to the bottom of the ramp, where a liquor store squatted next to a sickly yellow sign. It did not look like the kind of friendly establishment that might change a hundred or so a stranger, that might change a hundred so a stranger could help somebody he had met 45 seconds before. So I needed to make a purchase. I pushed the precious symbol of an admired friend's confidence under the iron bars of the cashier's cage and received in return four wrinkled twenties, a ten, a five, three ones, some change, and a diet soda. When I returned to the car, my new friend was rooting around in her bag. She had pulled out some grapefruits, of all things. Two of them rested on the floor of the car, looking bruised and well-traveled. I noticed that she wasn't quite as attractive as I first thought. Her hair was dirty, and so was the back of her neck. She smelled as if she had dabbed a spot of fresh motor oil on her pulse points. So you said twenty dollars, right? She had the bills in my hand and said, actually, I could use forty. Of course I knew she was lying. I had known she was lying as I stood in front of the metal cage of the liquor store cashier. I probably knew she was lying as soon as she got into my car, but by that point, it had become far easier to continue playing along than to call the whole thing off. She'd worked so hard in her scheme that it seemed cruel to disappoint her. And of course, by suddenly expressing doubt, I would be admitting that I had been stupid enough to believe her to that point. Once having committed stupidity, it seemed preferable to remain consistently stupid until the bitter end. <laughs> I would stick to my guns, even if they were pointed at my own head. <laughs> I gave her $40. She handed me a piece of paper with what she said was her name on it, plus her home phone number and her work number at a well-known restaurant. Call me and I will absolutely pay you back, she said, and hopped out of the car. Instead of going back up the ramp, she walked down into the street, turned to the corner and vanished. She no longer even bothered to pretend her car was stranded on the freeway. I took that as a tribute to my perspicacity. And the grapefruit she left on the floor of my car must have been some kind of gratuity. I went home. The previous five minutes were playing in the inside of my eyeballs like a traffic accident. I had been given a solemn gift laden with trust and expectation. And ten minutes later, I had quite literally given it to the first person who asked me for it. I called the phone number, scribbled in the paper. Her phone number didn't work. The restaurant said they never heard of her. Then I took a breath, and I called my writer friend. Bless her heart, she forgave me. She said that she would rather live in a world where you got taken on occasion than to have to start treating everybody who asked for help as a liar. I hope she didn't think what I was thinking, that if she wanted that money to go to a true creative artist, fate may have intervened to make sure it did. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Paul and Storm.